All right. So this is Adrian Chavez. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to say that, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Former student, uh, one, of, one of the best students that I've ever had. And uh, I'm really going to turn it over to him to explain what he does. And so what's going to happen is he will explain, this is what I do, blah, 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 blah. But unlike the videos, uh, this will be open for your questions. So if there's some questions you're missing, I'll probably go, what about this or what about that? Uh, but really, this will depend on what you're interested in as he tells you what he does and how he got there. So take my drink from you okay. and uh, turn the time over to him. I'm glad he was able to come down and just what I messaged you on Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. he was like, hey, I'm coming down. I'm like, Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so he's here in person. So visitor two, do we have visitors three? Oh yeah, yeah. Just and he'll be visitor three. So, so in other words, if I were you and ask questions, take notes that have to do with the answers that we have to, and then anything else, anything else you're interested in, just asking. To you know, can do whatever, and if he doesn't want to answer it or he can't answer it, yeah, I'll, know, and he'll tell you. Yeah. All right. Take it away. Amy. Sure. Well, I hope you guys aren't expecting much because uh, I, I believe James probably made you guys feel like I was a little bit more important than I was. But <laughs> yeah, so my name's Adrian. Um, I work at a company called Ublocks right now. Uh, I actually started working up for a tech startup called Sapcorda. And a lot of the companies that came together to make that startup that they were investing, they were watching all the progress that we made. And after a while, they decided, hey, you know what, your product is, is good enough to where we, where we think it's got a lot of potential, so we want to just go ahead and buy your company. And so one of those companies that was investing for us, Ublox, was the one that bought us out. Ublox is a very, very good company. It, um, they tend to do a lot of different things. So they're developing and producing a lot of microchips. They do some telecommunication services that you can buy out either for a company or even for personal use too. So kind of like a telecom provider. Uh, they make um, a lot of different hardware and merchandise for, uh, I wanna call it just marathons or triathletes. Um, they make a, a lot of different materials, but what I do specifically is I'm one of the engineers that do research and development for our GN GNSS side. The GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite Systems. So what I do extra specifically is me and my team are kind of looking into the future and the development of products that have to do with precise GPS. So to kind of give you an example of what that means in terms of everyday use is I like to talk about all of the autonomous self-driving cars or the cargo ships, planes, drones, things like that. So as technology keeps on advancing, we wanna make it so that way it's completely autonomous. Cause right now there are certain vehicles out there that they can sort of drive for you. You're not supposed to you know, take your hands off the wheel for too long, otherwise it starts screaming at you. But basically it can, guide itself using the sensors so that way they can stay inside of the lanes. They can sometimes do a little bit of the turning for you. I'm sure you guys have probably seen some videos like that on YouTube of Teslas or things like that doing it. But our goal is to make it that each one of these vehicles will have a module inside of it that can communicate with all of the satellites to tell it exactly where it is with a precision of under 10 centimeters. And the reason that they actually saw a need for that is because Right now, the way that those cars are guiding themselves is by using sensors that they look at the lines on the sides of the road and they make sure, okay, if you're getting too close to this side, push it to this side. If you're getting too close to this side, push it back. But one thing that I don't think a lot of people really looked at was, okay, well, what happens when it snows? You know, you, you can't see the lines on the road or if you're out here in, on a dirt trail, there's no lines on the road. So what happens? You can't use that feature anymore. So now using the same GPS that you guys would use inside of your phones or things like that. We needed to make sure that you're able to see exactly where you are, especially if you were, for example, riding on a drone or on one of these things that drives itself, you need to know exactly where you are. 
So that's what my team does, engineering the best way to, to make the future of that product. And it's, uh, it's been a really, really great experience. This is an international company, so I get to work with colleagues all over the world. Some people are working over in Korea, some people in, inside of Japan and Germany. And even for my training, this is such a specific field that there's not exactly a lot of classes that I can just go to a college and take. So what they did is they actually, when I first started, they flew me over to Germany and I started working over there for a few months, um, basically just learning from all the experts that are over there. Um, it was a quite interesting experience, a, a big culture shock for sure, but ultimately it's been a, a really great ride. And I, I like to come in and talk to you guys, especially right now, you're probably trying to decide, you know, what, what area of technology you guys want to get into if you go into technology at all, or maybe you want to go into business or things like that. But I try to let everybody know that there's potential to go out into places that you've never even imagined before. I, I actually used to be sitting inside of those same seats about four years ago. So it, it's been a bit of a crazy ride, but I graduated from here in 2018. And since then, the first, first job that I had gotten was actually right before I finished from here because we needed to do the internship class to, to, to get that credit before we can graduate. I was lucky enough to get an internship that was over in Wisconsin and I, I had to put in some effort to make sure that I was able to get an apartment and a roommate <laughs> and make sure that my family was gonna be okay without me for a few months. And once I did that and saw how different things were outside of here, that's what kind of, it, it pushed me to see what, what else was out there. And uh, whenever I came back with that experience, there was a position open at the Thatcher School District. And so I, I took on that, that position as a hardware specialist and basically doing tech support for the whole district. After that, um, I'm, I'm sure as you all know, Safford's a pretty small town. So where it kind of gets around when you know how to do something. <clears throat> uh, pretty soon I started getting recruited by other places, seeing if I can go and help them with their IT. I was working for, I, I actually worked for MGIO with your brother. Evans. Yeah, your cousin, sorry. Um, for the telescope up there at U of A, I was doing their tech support over there too. Um, I, was, I was doing some support for a couple of the businesses out here. Then uh, there were some people that were basically scouting for they, they were looking for people to run their network at this startup. And while they were visiting down here one time installing a, what we call a reference station, they were kind of asking around, you know, who, who would be interested in doing this kind of thing? Who, who knows a little bit of IT and, and would be willing to learn some other things. And my name got mentioned to them and they called me. I had an interview over here with that person. And then he set up an interview over there with the VP and before, before too long, I was, I, I got to admit, I was really, really nervous. I was talking to Mr. McBride and Ms. Monta and asking them, hey, you know, I, I have this opportunity. What do you guys think? Should I, should I go for it? Or, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty settled here, but, but man, that was a, a tough decision for me. Anyways, I, I wanted to give it a shot. And ever since then, it's, it's really paid off. Um, like I said, I got, I got to travel to a lot of different places. And I started out there working as one of their one of their people that does IT, and I was helping them to set up all of their networks there. Um, I got to edit myself to make sure I don't say too, too much information here, but <laughs> um, basically I was setting up some systems and creating ways so that way we can monitor the way that our data flows between here and inside of different countries and from our devices to to customers essentially and it got pretty complex there for a while because we were just starting it out but uh, we were able to get everything automated um, especially when they asked me if I could be a leader for the team I was thinking yeah, I don't want to be getting called all weekend and at three in the morning when something breaks so let's automate as much as we can and um, they they were really appreciative of my work then after a while 
the people that train me, they're like, hey, well, you know, we like the work that you've been doing. So, you know, we'd, we'd like for you to come and work with us too. So I, I moved teams and I was working with um, the level to support the experts inside of the field. And after a few months there, then the vice president of engineering for the company says, hey, you know what? I really like how much you've been willing to learn here. I really see the growth and progress that you've made ever since you've started here. So I want you to come and work on my team. And so now I work with him inside of research and development with some of the best, best colleagues that I've ever had. Um, not only are they teaching me stuff every single day, I, I, I know I kind of accentuate on this every time I'm here, but I'm always the dumbest person in the room when it comes to whose team I'm on. But it's always a great thing because I'm, I'm there so that way I could learn. And these are the best people that you could possibly learn from. They've been inside of the field since it was started. Um, one of my colleagues, he actually learned how to program from the inventor of basic C programming. That was who taught him how to do it whenever he was young. And so now I get to work with him and I get to learn a lot of cool little tricks and things that I would have never even thought about or knew that they were there. So that's me. Now I'm here today to answer any questions that you guys might have if you've thought about going into this field or if there's any way I can help. But, I mentioned you did an internship. internship. Um, mm -hmm. So when you left your job here, the company that hired you, they paid you to do this internship? I, I was lucky enough that this was a paid internship. Okay. So I was able to support myself. And I got to be honest, I actually lost money by the time that I took me to travel and move all my stuff over there, put the deposits down on apartments, travel back, and then get my stuff going again here. When you say internship, what was it? Was it for a certification? Was it for a certificate? Is it for what? So the internship was tech support at a school district, but it was a very large school district. So to kind of give you an idea, at the Thatcher School District, when I was working there, there was probably about 2,000 devices, which most of it were Chromebooks and PCs and some laptops for the teachers, uh, some smart boards. Over at the school district I was working at in Wisconsin, there was over 10,000 devices. Almost every student has their own individual iPad that's inside of a mobile device management system. And that's, of course, uh, ran by all of the tech support there. Then all of the teachers have a MacBook as a personal laptop that they, they would use for work. And while they were at their workstation, they would be working off of a Mac mini that's connected to a smart board. And they also had Chromebooks too. But I think when I went there, I was helping them to kind of um, deploy all of the newer Apple devices. And they were starting to phase out some of the Chromebooks because they were at the end of their life cycle. So you just brought them up to speed from books and... Um, helping, helping them to transfer over everything. Oh, okay. Um, a lot of it actually went into training because some of these people hadn't ever used an Apple device before. Yeah. So, yeah, so there was a lot of uh, communicating on how to get things done, especially if they weren't used to it or if they had everything saved in their Google Drive and they didn't know how to get access to all of the information that they needed for their lesson plans, things like that. It was difficult. But. Uh, so was it difficult for, uh, for you to get your internship? Because, I mean, Wisconsin seems like a, a pretty big shift in environment, I guess. Yeah. Um, so actually, there were some places available here for some internships, okay. but I, I'll, I'll let you know that I personally wanted to kind of look for something a little bit out of scope. Okay. And there was a reason behind it, which was over here, most of the places from school districts to, I believe, the hospital and the county, a lot of them use Chrome or Google okay. devices, which is you know, it, it's good. It's going to get the job finished and everything. But I thought, okay, well, if I learned that, then I can go anywhere that Google is used. But if I go and if I learn something else that's different, not only would I be a better asset here for problems that they hadn't even seen yet, but it opens my scope of where I can go afterwards if I decided to leave. A full different company, and I noticed that um, you do a lot of IoT stuff. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a platform and software here called ThingStream, and I just looked it up. But I right. that. Mm -hmm. Is that specific communication within your devices? Is that 
Uh, you, programming language, what is that? The ThinkStream platform is a way to kind of set up an account with, with any of the devices that, that are using it, but there's a lot of other companies too that actually, they want to use their own devices and they'll still set up a Think, ThinkStream account. So that way they can kind of set up a, not only a billing access, but a portal. So that way they can, you know, talk to the support and figure out how to transfer. So ThinkStream um, wasn't something that program that exists out there that uh they they developed it you oh. you blocks developed the things thing okay. stream side but they they use it as an end-to-end -end point because other companies are going to be bringing their own devices so that way they could for example use that precise those precise coordinates okay and they need a way to figure out how to transfer the I'm trying to figure out how to put yeah, this, I but know. I have an idea. I was in the military, so when I was on the service, I would bring your device with me and they can communicate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about, you know. Right. There's there's a specific word that I'm trying to think of, but basically, you know, we have a certain format that all of our code is transferred out and that's distributed, and other devices can pick it up, but that format isn't read by their devices internally, so they have to figure out a way so that way they can transfer it into what their devices can read it. And code it, so to speak? Basically, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So is this company you block that you work for, are they, uh, it sounds like they might do some, according to what the sort of things are showing out, they might do some military or government or secret stuff, that, or is it just proprietary? No, so actually they, and on their website, I think it, it actually gives a pretty good definition that, um, we don't deal with anything that has to do with um, any war related or government related products, things like that. And we don't, we also don't distribute to any of those types of companies that do either. They want to make a, a firm stance that we don't want to support any, any type of that. <laughs> so. I can get her in, in my, doing them, so I not, no pain. <laughs> yeah. No. Don't pay very well. <laughs> the only reason that I can't really elaborate on yeah. On everything is just because since it, it's still research and development, it's stuff that that hasn't been released yet. Right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. huh. Right, and if you reveal both secret, yeah, that's kind of like a insider trading kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I was I was actually told the same thing when I when I worked for um, <clears throat> when I got a job at uh, Stern Roof. They told me it's like okay, you can't really say what you like specifically what you make here, what you do here, because that's insider trading. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, I got a question. Sorry, he, yeah, it's at the first. Um, what's your, like, the pay range for, like, your position while you're doing research and development? Okay, so um, I can't say specifically because it's always going to be based on people's credentials. Right. You know, how, how high of a degree do they have? How many certifications? How many years of experience? And honestly, this is such a new field still that there's not really a, a good place to market at. Even whenever I was first starting, they were they were negotiating with me saying, okay, well, this is what you're going to do. These would be your daily tasks. You know, what do you feel is comfortable and, and we'll, we'll answer if that's doable or not. Um, but I guess the closest position would be towards a developer or software engineer, which I know some people starting to get into the field, they'll start around 50,000 to 60,000 per year, but the range can also go up to around 400,000 per year so it's it's just gonna <clears throat> depend on how much you know especially to that specific niche but i i can tell you it's right. it's a a very comfortable area to be living in um they not only do they compensate you financially but they also want to make sure that they give you a break because the, the work that we do can kind of take a toll on you when you're looking at code every single day or trying to develop Trying to develop these systems takes a lot of knowledge inside of physics in order so that way you can understand exactly how the satellites are communicating with all the receivers here on the Earth. Um, to give you an example, one of the things that we were learning not too long ago was the way that the satellites are, as they're hanging above the ionosphere. I don't think so. Oh, I don't think I want to draw on camera. <laughs> so basically 
when you have a satellite in the sky. It starts off with an antenna that's going to shoot all of the signals. And it's connected to, on each side, some big square. These are some solar panels. Now, these solar panels, as they're you know, hovering or staying inside of their orbit, the way that they're powered up is with the sun. And while the Earth's rotating, of course, they're going to move. So those solar panels can kind of adjust and move and twist while they're spinning in orbit. And every time it moves just a tiny little bit, if you guys have ever, um, I don't know, gone shooting, when you have some target practice, you know that if you just barely move, maybe a centimeter, it can change where you're gonna shoot by a few feet, a few meters. And it's the same whenever this is trying to shoot the signal down to the receivers. So we have to take account for all of those little adjustments too. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff that I would have never thought about. Um, we also have to account for things like um, ocean tide loading. So the way that the oceans are coming in and coming out, a lot of people don't realize, and you can't ever feel it, but the earth, the crust is constantly moving. It's being twisted and pulled and pushed. Sort of if you guys are ever washing dishes and you have a cup of water, when you pull it up, it pulls the water with it from all the oxygen that's inside of there, kind of suctions it. So the water does the same thing inside of the ocean to the earth. Like yeah, exactly. So whenever we have a receiver that we're trying to nail down all the coordinates for, it, it's constantly moving. So we have to account for that too. So you really have to have a, a good understanding. And I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't have any understanding of physics when I came into this company, but um, learning from these experts, that's that was a big part of it. Go ahead. You said you did your training in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, what part of Germany did you do training in? The city was Hanover. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. oh I'm wearing my Dortmund shirt. That's why I asked. Okay, cool. Right on. Did you say Hanover? Hanover. 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 H. Yeah. Hanover. Sorry, I can't hear that word. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. It's Hanover. 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 Oh, that's it. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Go ahead. What kind of um, security make you have? inside of your work uh for security yeah like you, your, your work. You, you don't have to have anything specifically to get in it's just once once you become a part of the company they tell you you can't disclose all of the information about what we're working on what we're doing or or how we do it because this this format of communication that's being broadcast to the receivers uh this is actually something that as a tech startup this format of communication was developed by them hmm. so this is an in-house product too and of course the reason being that we bought up we were bought out as a company but it was developed in-house so again we can't we can't share yeah, all the yeah, information yeah. i was yeah. wondering about like in like like if you think you're an international government how about you have like g7 g7 or like g6 License rates to get in. Oh, it, it's not related to the government itself. Okay. We have to follow certain protocols and standards because just, you know, to be approved by certain governments to be used inside of any of their equipment or for our receivers that are over there, they have to follow whatever guidelines the government in that area propose. So what degree did you get out of the end? What did you come out with certification degree? So I came out with the AAS for Computer Information Specialist. That was the degree I came for here. Is that still what it's called here? Yeah. Yep. And then I also have my certification for Network Plus as soon as I came out of here. Um, and, you know, specifically, I went for that one just because I, I was a little bit more interested in networking rather than uh, some of the other things that were out there at the time. Do you have your CompTIA? It, it was through CompTIA. But, Do you think that made it more valuable? Yes. Yes. Um, in fact, one of the people that had interviewed me over inside of that school district in Wisconsin, um, they were telling me that they were getting 
a little over 50 applications per day. And while they were going through resumes, that was one of the deciding factors. So it was like, okay, well, out of this stack, no one here actually even went to school for this. So let's kind of put put them to the side and we'll we'll use them if we need them later. But then we'll move to this stack over here because these people went to school for it. And then these people went to school and got certified. And that's the first pile that they were looking through. So it it's essentially what gave me the the head start. Both, both mm -hmm. So you say you work in teams. Mm -hmm. What range of personnel do you have on the teams? I mean from programmers to what to network engineers to what? So actually, um the teams are kind of split up into what it is that they're working on. So the teams, for example, we have an infrastructure team that's putting together all of the hardware so that way they could create reference stations. Another team is dedicated to monitoring the system because it's a live system 24 seven that people are using. So they need to be constantly watching it. Um, the team that I'm, I'm on specifically, everyone there does have to do some coding. That's usually just part of the whole engineering thing is you, you have to know how to code. Um, One of the people that's on my team, she she actually came out of the military inside of an area, but she was doing programming for them. So she came strictly as a programmer. That's all that she had came came from doing. Um, I'm coming more from the world of IT, but it's going into the same thing. Another person, they came specifically from that field, from doing GPS and uh, I'll I'll try to elaborate a little bit more on the VP. He he's actually from Brazil, and he went to school for GPS specifically. And he, I didn't know this until just recently, but a lot of the equipment that they use for land surveying and getting those precise coordinates, um, he was the one who actually coded and made a lot of the devices that were out there when he was working for another company while going to school. It. His name is written there as the person that created it, but because he was working under a company, um, basically all the credit goes to them. <laughs> so he's just, he's got his name in the user manual, that's it. But yeah, go ahead. A couple of things, since I know a little bit of the inside, um, what really what he's describing is he, because of uh, his focus on getting things done, like mm -hmm. wherever he went, I remember that he's going to get it done. He's given a task, he's going to get it done. Uh, because of that focus, when he went into this organization, that gave him the ability to choose a little more of what he wanted to do, right? You could have stayed on the networking side and been part of that team, right? but you looked at what you wanted to do and said, I want to do this, and because of your attitude and, and your ability to learn, you were like, okay, let, let's do that. That sounds like a good idea. And that is not an uncommon thing in the industry because everybody that works in the industry knows that you kind of start out with where your interest is. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to move along in it, they're like, well, you know, if you want to do that and you're a good employee, let's let you do that because they know your interest might change. All right, and so that's something you, you can expect to, as I've said, not get bottlenecked. Not well, you, you're doing this. And that's what you're going to do now, unless you can show somehow you can do something else. And as long as you're that solid employee that's going to help the cause, it's going to push things forward. They usually will just welcome that and say, "Okay, yeah, but let's let's have you do that." Yeah. Unless, of course, there's. I'm sorry, we've already got 18 people on that team. And, there's just no room for you. Yeah. So it's not like they're coming out a lot of upward and lateral movement. Yeah, there was there was a lot of that. Um it, it is a lot with what McBride is saying. Um not everyone in the company really wanted to learn more. A lot of them were like, oh, this is this was a lot to take in as it was. You know, I, I think I'm I'm good staying here. And there's a lot of people that they even though they wanted to go into a different area, their attitude wasn't exactly the best in saying how they wanted to do so. And the employers kind of looked at that a little bit negatively and said, okay, well, 
unless you're doing exactly what you want to do, you're not going to be happy working with us. So we know it's kind of a <laughs> unlimited time that you're going to be wanting to work here. So we're not going to invest our time or our money inside of you because it's got to be mutually beneficial too. They've got to get some sort of benefit out of it also. Yeah, actually that's, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to move. I mean, I, I don't want to disclose all my all, yeah. ulterior motives here, but well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's one of the quicker ways to actually move up inside of your pay scale is you, you learn this niche, you kind of practice for the next one up. And when you're ready for it, you can move, move into there if there's an opportunity available. And if not, I, I don't want to say that you should leave a company and, you know, go at, after what you're looking for, but that is one of the ways that you can say, okay, well, I've done this. I have this experience. I know how to do this, but I can get that opportunity here. If you guys give me that opportunity here at the pay scale that I want, then yeah, I'd be willing to make that change. So it's, it's been a good way to, to move. So one thing we talk about is soft skills in this, in this class, and that's part of soft skills, being able to sell your, your, yourself, because look what, here's what I've learned and here's what I'm doing. I would like to know if you would allow me to move up. I think that is selling as to why your skills are now able to move you laterally or upward. Yeah, and, and then you got to show them too. You yeah. really have to push it. Yeah, and, and show them your skills exactly. Yeah, because there's so many people that even when I was working inside of the different areas, they said, oh, well, you're doing that. I could do that. I, I even do some of that here. And whenever it came to doing a task that was a little bit related, they they either didn't want to do it or or they, they ran into trouble. They didn't know how. And they didn't want to figure out the way how to do it. Because uh, the resources were all there. They're all there available. Like I said, the VP that I, that I work with, he he's incredible in how much knowledge he has. And he will take the time to show people that are interested in doing it, but he's not gonna waste his time just telling someone how something's done just for the fun of it. He'll, he'll literally say that that's just a waste of his time, that he could be doing something to contribute to, to the company. So he wants to make sure that whatever it is that he's doing has a purpose behind it. Yeah. What kind of software, but, sorry. I was just going to ask what kind of software programming are you just doing? So whenever I was inside of that networking area and, and it's still being used, um, we were using a software to monitor a lot of the SNMP devices. It's a simple network management protocol devices. Basically, every every electronic device, whether it's a washer, dryer, a microwave, or whatever, whenever there's trouble with it, they a lot of the companies will have a tool to diagnose it. It'll pull up some codes. Those codes are working off of that simple network management protocol. The software that we were using to manage everything that our system touched, all the devices, routers, um, all the routers, gateways, firewalls, everything, they all have their SNMP ports and you had to connect them, but you had to do it with scripts running Python. So I had to learn Python for that. One of the GPS softwares that we were using actually had their own programming language that they developed. So I had to learn one that was very specific to that, which was very related to basic C, along with some of the regular commands that you would enter into a command prompt. It was kind of a mix of the two. And now I also use a lot of embedded C. Um, I will also give you a tip in telling you if you want to impress someone that Knowing C is really good, any C language, well, not any C language, I'll say C++ and embedded C is really good because it's more environmentally friendly than any other language that's out there right now. So no C sharp? Um, no C sharp, not right now. Correct. Yeah, but I, I can tell you, in some of the AWS systems, they're they're using a lot of C sharp inside of there for their scripts. So it's definitely something that's still being heavily utilized. Not not necessarily within our company altogether, but at least AWS for sure is using it right now. 
which if, if you guys didn't know, AWS is the cloud cloud service for Amazon. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, sorry to take this question for time. I, I'm curious. Go ahead. Um, so you learned Python in mm -hmm. job. Yes, actually, I remember whenever we were starting this, I was actually talking to Mr. McBride and Mrs. Monta at the time. And I was kind of asking them for tips on, you know, okay, I know this is what's going to be used. What resources do you guys usually like to recommend for, you know, learning how to code a specific language really quick? And some of the suggestions were taking the courses on Udemy, um, Coursera, things like that. I, I actually talked to my company and they were willing to uh, help me get into some online courses from the University of Michigan, I think. And it, you know, I, I could see that it, it, they were teaching some really good uh, syntax and structure there. But honestly, I learned more from from the Udemy classes and wow. and just uh, I had already taken C sharp and Swift development here, so I knew the syntax. I just needed to know precisely for Python specifically how they were implementing and doing different things, doing their methods, doing their doing their um, variable naming and what really kind of bit me one time was their spacing and indentation. <laughs> if you didn't know, it's it's got to be right on for Python language. Otherwise, you'll end up with some errors and it won't run altogether. It's kind of interesting because I've always asked about you and how many people you utilize it. I utilize it a lot. Yeah. I, I have more courses I've purchased. Yeah, they have sales like for 10 bucks. Yeah. $100 courses. Right. And I have them on 150. So I slowly get to one at a time. By all means, I'll say that the downside of it is you can't really, you know, call them and ask them all the questions that you have. So that that part hurts. For that, I'll always recommend, you know, coming coming to an actual physical class and learning from them so you could pick people's brain from it. What type of coding you got licensed for? Like how many coding you um, uh, that's a good question. I think I've probably forgotten more of them that <laughs> than anything. But I I do pretty well with uh, C plus plus. Like I said, there, there was one that was very specific to that actual software that I was using, and I'm unfortunately really good with that. Um, I know Swift. I did C Sharp, and I still remember that one pretty well, too. All the C languages are very, very similar, so whenever you learn one, you can usually do a lot of them. The difference being some of them don't have methods where they're actually inside of classes um, and the way that they're pointing to memory. So and inside of embedded C, you really have to, and this is what makes it eco-friendly, is you're, you're able to adjust what goes on the stack versus what goes on the heap inside of there. And you can kind of create pointers to make, make things use memory inside of the device more efficiently. With that being said, Python does not do that at all. They are probably the worst. <laughs> They're probably the worst with that area. So it's going to depend on exactly if, you can kind of narrow your focus for what it is you want to do. There's so many resources that are out there. It's best to kind of just look at what you're going to need specifically for that. But if not, then try to get a little bit of everything inside of there. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask him, so like we're talking about people. And I was like, OK, well, we all work with computers here um, and then or want to work with computers. Right. So computers aren't necessarily people sometimes. Correct. And so how much, how often do you actually get to, um, like your team, for example, like how many times do you actually get to work with somebody in the day? Or are you like at any given day in your job here? So inside of our company, not only do we want to make sure that we're collaborating with people mm -hmm. very closely, but we, we push for more human interaction. Specifically, I, I was kind of the one that really, really pushes on, on our side is for the development of other people. So that way people can get that opportunity to learn new things. It's best to be working with people that are more advanced than you are. And because of that in my team, obviously I'm the lowest on the totem pole inside of there, but we make it a goal for our, our whole team to be working together because others are benefiting from the learning too and from being around each other. But we usually spend about four to six hours per day working together since a lot of us are living in different locations we we have to do a lot of work through teams teams is a platform that we use 
but we'll set up a room and we have the meeting room open for all day long. And a lot of times we just join in. Sometimes we do some pair programming, which means other people are watching while I share the screen and I, I, I do the coding or another person will take over and they'll do the coding on certain things and I'll be watching. But we're all communicating on what we're doing, how we're doing it, what's the most efficient way to do this. And it's actually a struggle for most of us because like I said, this is such a new field and we really have one one big expert inside of GNSS and he, he's got a lot of stuff on his plate. So he'll try to give us guidance on how to implement something, but then he's got to go and we've kind of got to make sure to figure it out and implement it the correct way. And we do a lot of testing, a lot of testing and and make sure that it works right before we actually include it into into any system. But I, I would actually say this job is more so learning than anything else right now for me. It's probably about 70% learning as opposed to doing the actual physical work of coding something in there and testing it and testing it on different devices and deploying it. Uh, like I said, for me, it was it was a little bit easier because I knew the syntax since um, taking the programming classes here. I really wish I would have uh, been able to take some more advanced programming classes too, just because, I mean, like I said, some of the people that I've just on my team specifically, they have been doing this for more than 10 years. So you can imagine someone that's barely putting it into practice in a real physical workplace. It, it was difficult and pretty embarrassing, but, <laughs> but that, that's part of it. And that's what they like too. They like that I was honest about what I didn't know. And I always told them, okay, I don't know this as an expert yet. I, I know the basics, but if you guys can teach me, I'm very willing to learn. I'll spend extra time here working with you guys either before or after whatever's best for your guys' schedule. You guys are the ones that are giving me the knowledge, so I'll make that adjustment. And they did. They they brought me up to a lot of what they know, and I'm I'm not going to say that I'm at their level yet, but given enough time, I will be. I'm going to ask Mr. McBride a question, but when he's talking basic programming, is he talking the basic like what I'm thinking, or the basic? He just he just means more simple things, not the actual language. Okay. Yeah, because I'm Correct. in high school and it's basic. I mean, it's when TRS 80s came out, give me a break, it's way back. Okay, no, I, I get what you mean. Yeah, I, I meant the more simplified parts okay. of it. Okay, yeah, yeah, a lot of ones you're getting data in and out of things mm -hmm. using SQL or anything like that. Uh, my team doesn't, there's, there's other teams inside of the company that do, but I, uh, I don't have to work with that, which. Don't get me wrong, I like SQL and it's very powerful once you get to know it. But for some reason, me, when I look at it, I personally just, it looks too congested for me and I, I start getting a headache. But but it's one of the things I actually thought about doing because I know a lot of other people don't like doing it. So I thought, okay, well, if I can make a habit of it, then then there's a lot of opportunity. So I have Python and C++, C++ for me. I still don't know it. It's in class, I get an A in class. She goes Python, and I look at Python. Oh God, this is so easy. Mm -hmm. Because it was harder for her. Yeah. I'm like, wow, that's strange. And just, I guess, the brain way somebody's brain thinks. You know. Yeah. Well, and it's a lot of um, getting used to something. Uh, I try to explain it as like whenever a new iPhone comes out or whenever they took off took off the home button. <laughs> that was so hard for a lot of people, and for me too. I I, I didn't really like it, but after getting used to it, well, I don't need the home button. Take it off. Just make it faster, you know. <laughs> Interesting. But you get used to a certain way of doing things, and so I think that's what actually makes it harder to to go on different languages. Do you find any of your team members difficult to work with? <laughs> uh, actually, I don't. This company's done a really good job at looking at the personality of people before they hire them, and they'll say, "Okay, well, we know that this person's willing to." you know go through the hardships of communication because i mean let's face it a lot of us got into it because we didn't want to deal with people right we'd rather deal with a machine but when it comes to how versatile you can be 
the people that can actually describe what it is that they're doing and teach others, they're the ones that are a little bit more valuable. They're, they're able to teach others that come in new to the company, which that's one of the things that I do there too. I'll, I'll train a lot of the new hires for going and monitoring that networking side of things. That's a small, a small thing to do for me, at least in my eyes, but there's not a lot of people that know how to train others. They get too frustrated. They get too irritated. And because this company is international, there's a lot of other cultures too that you, you have to be willing to be patient with them where you have that difficulty in the English language barrier because there's a lot of different languages and they're, they're trying to make the adjustment. And a lot of them are very, very intelligent, but they just, they can't come up with the correct words to describe what it is that they're trying to tell you. You know, this is, that part's really difficult. What countries do you find that most of the to deal with or have you found? You know, I, I, it's just because of the job that the company did and finding people that are open to, to do this. Okay. I didn't have trouble with it. Oh, Germany? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to deal with Germany in my last job, but I did. And for the language barrier, it was tough because I had to sell to the like the did translation interpretation services and how I I deal with the Vitas. And so um, yeah. And it brought on and it was just the language barrier, like you said, you know, because in English they want to speak English and they really don't know the words to get up and yeah and be not learning their language. So Right. I, I tried to learn as much German as I could, but I of course, the most important things for me were just, you know, the food that I was going to eat or, or what I was going to be at. What was the period of time that you were there? Did it was like more? Yeah. So did it, did you ever get to like learn enough where you're like, okay, I know what he's saying. I maybe could hold a conversation with him. If they would speak slowly, <laughs> I could. Such man. Yeah, exactly. Your size at least be slow. <laughs> Last question. Do you live in Phoenix? Yes. Mm -hmm. We we have an office over there in Scottsdale, and that's the one that I report to. So right now we work hybrid. So I, I go there three days a week, work from home two days a week. That's not bad. Hmm. So with your degree in certifications, how many all in all certifications do you have beside your degree? Well, that's a good question. I I think probably about four different online certifications and then the degrees that I had came here for specifically. And actually this is a little bit less relevant, but while I was trying to go to school, I of course needed to pay for school, right? So I I was working for a long time, saving up for tuition. And, and of course, while I was still going to school, still working. So I also got certifications for a laboratory technician, medical laboratory technician, um, I did auto body collision, so I'm certified with that, with color adjustment, with painting vehicles. I did tile insulation. I did vehicle wrapping, so I'm 3M certified. It's... I don't feel so mean because I don't need that certification. They just decided to throw it in. Yeah, no, it's, but, it's always um, good. Do you find that you're going to further get further certification? Do you find it necessary, or is it something you want to obtain? It's something I want to obtain because I know that I can negotiate a higher salary. Right. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Yeah. That's the important stuff, right? It's a big part of it. It's a big part of it. Um, before we go, we will hold class on Wednesday. If you don't have a job, show up nine o'clock Wednesday. Okay. And uh, we'll discuss some things. Uh, most of the time will be spent discussing whatever you want. Uh, but there's information we haven't gone through in here for a while. So we'll go through that. So again, if you got a job, yeah. And you're not going to be here. But uh, if you don't, then show up Wednesday and we'll go through some information. I'd like to thank Adrian for coming and answering those questions. If you think of any further questions, then actually post them as part of your assignment and I will pass them on and he can answer. And... Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Adrian Chavez. Should I, should I announce that one? Welcome to class. Only if you do it like Rocky. <laughs>